How's it going, Chris? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thanks for uh, willing to do this. Of course. Anything for the community, man. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to only focus on 86. I can talk about other things as well. Sure. Yeah. I actually just watched um, a few days ago. I watched Story Without Words. Oh, my. <laughs> you did? <laughs> oh, God. What did you think? I thought it was good. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I, that was that was a, that was a long time ago. I was one of the first things I ever did. I didn't think I was going to be a like a professional voice actor when I did that. So, and here we are. Crazy, right? You want to talk about that for anybody who doesn't familiar? Oh yeah. Uh, Story without words is a uh, small little fan film I did. If anybody doesn't know, I started out voice acting. Uh, I did a lot of fan stuff. Um, I, I'm I'm an anime fan myself. Uh, anime and video games. I I'm, I'm a streamer. I used to play semi professional League of Legends. Like I. I I'm in it, and uh, it's uh, it's a small fan film that I did. We filmed it in Chicago in like 2017, I want to say. Um, it took about a week. Uh, it was very rough and tumble guerrilla filming. We had a little budget. Um, we did uh, a Kickstarter. I think we raised. I think it was like 25 grand that we had to raise, and uh, that was to pay everybody across the board. Um, it was non-union. Uh, it was just a bunch of friends. It was a lot of people that I used to know too. I, I, we, we, we stayed in my buddy's apartment in Chicago, other voice actors like Michaela Laws and, and a couple other people were involved as, as like producers and things like that. But yeah. Uh, and it was, a uh, like a fan fiction that centered around, uh, attack on Titan. Um, that was like a modern alternate universe of attack on Titan uh, with like a romance between John and Aaron. Um, so it that, that was a small little thing that I used to do. Um, but uh, I have a DVD of it, actually. I even have a poster of it somewhere around here uh, that we all signed and you know, <laughs> tried to make a big deal out of it. But um, thank you for watching. I appreciate that. It's, it's still up on YouTube if you guys would like to go and watch it. It's called uh, A Story Without Words, which doesn't make any sense as a title. But um, once you watch it, you get it. <laughs> and I think what around that same time would be when you were uh, doing Damien and Seduce Me. Yeah, that was one of the first things I ever did um, as a voice actor, period. Actually, uh, Michaela Laws, again, I mentioned her. Uh, she came to me. This is when I was doing stuff on Tumblr. And, like, you know, I was coming home from college uh, classes, and I would sit down at my computer, and I would just – I had I had a little ho a hobby of recording tiny things that I would just make up and improvise on the spot. Uh, sometimes it would be in a character. Sometimes it would be, like, a Shakespeare sonnet or a poem or reading an excerpt from a show or reading an excerpt from – uh, you know, a Shakespeare show or, you know, reading a monologue of some kind, just something to dip my toe into the whole voice acting thing and see if it's something that people would like to hear. And uh, people did like it. I got I got fairly popular um, almost overnight. It was weird on Tumblr. I was the most attention I've ever gotten in my life. Um, and I've done like stage shows and things like that. But I would upload something and then go to class and, you know, refresh my feed as I was in class. And I'd go to the... Um, uh, I want to say commissary, but I, I go to the uh, the buffet that we had at college, and I would sit down, eat breakfast, and scroll through and see what people were saying, and people really liked it, which uh, was very, very surprising. But yeah, uh, Michaela came to me after that all happened and was like, hey, do you want to be in my thing? I didn't audition for it. Didn't do anything like that. Uh, Seduce Me is a, is a, is a visual novel um, that I did that was the first job I ever got paid professionally to do uh, professionally. It was an indie. It was an indie game. It's still available if you want to go buy it. I think it's. I, I think it's even free. Um, it's on Steam. I play a character named Damien, who is an incubus. Um, we're all fairly sexy boys, as a matter of fact. Alejandro Saab is also in Seduce Me. Uh, it was. I've known Alejandro for almost ten years at this point. We've been good friends for a long time. Um, who else is in that? Alejandro Saab, Bradley Gareth, Ethan Nakashima, uh, and many, many more. <laughs> all, all, all still friends to this day. But yeah, that was that was that was a while ago, man. <laughs> Almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And talking about your uh, stage credits, do you have a favorite um, show that you performed in? Because I know that you said before that you were uh, in uh, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. And yeah, I I, I played. Um, oh, what is his name? Uh, he was the head of the mailroom. Um, I played him in How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. That was a long time ago, but uh, that was really fun. Uh, I think one of the most the most fun I had on stage was probably Gaston. I played Gaston at a production of Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not I'm not as big as Gaston. So we had this like little light muscle suit that I had on. Maybe it looked ripped. I looked huge. Um, but that was fun from like a performance standpoint. I've done a lot of Shakespeare. 
uh i played uh, um uh, caliban in a production uh of shakespeare a shakespeare show i did a couple of seasons with cincinnati shakespeare society that was really fun um i know i did one season with cincinnati shakespeare i i, I had to move <laughs> after the first season um i did some louisville repertory theater and that was just you know theater um i did a small like ch traveling children's show in kentucky uh i i i've done all kinds of stuff like i've run the gambit the musicals plays you know avant-garde theater i've been nude on stage like i've done all kinds of crazy stuff i realized that as much as i loved theater and as much as i love the performances um rehearsal was a lot of time it was a lot of time to do rehearsal and if you aren't 100 percent into like all in on theater that time you realize that time just kind of goes away it's like nine ten hours a day of rehearsal um, at a point, you you some people live above the theater, and they live as a as a theater troupe, and then they come down and rehearse, and then go back up to live, and then come down and rehearse, and they can rehearse up there. It, it's it, they live and breathe theater, and I was like that during college. We pretty much had to be, um, just because of the way the structure was. Uh, you, if you weren't in a show, you were backstage building something, or you were a dramaturg or you were a producer, or you were AD, or you were a stage manager, or something like that. So you were always in theater, but I realized that I liked to play video games a lot. A lot. And I like to watch anime a lot. And I like to read manga, and, and that stuff takes time. And uh, as I was doing the stuff on Tumblr, I realized that in college, I was getting paid more to do voice acting independently by myself than I was working at the deli I used to work at. I worked at a deli, I worked at Staples, I did construction, I uh, did uh, I did black tar roofing for uh, a summer, which was, I got terrible sunburn, bad experience. Don't do black tar roofing unless you like really enjoy that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it, uh, theater, I, I realized I needed to pivot because I, I, I wanted to do video games and anime more than I did you know, rehearse in theater. And I still do theater, but, um, you know, you, you give me two weeks to memorize a script and then I go and rehearse a day and then we do one production or something like that. It's not these big grandiose things anymore. I don't go do a musical in, in North Hollywood or anything like that anymore because I've, I've, I've cemented myself in the voice acting industry in Los Angeles and uh, it's slowly getting more and more busy mm -hmm. and more and more people want me to be in more and more things. Um, and that's fantastic. So, yeah. I used to do a hell of a lot of theater, probably four to six productions a year, which is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> is performing on stage also where you um, got affinity with singing like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra type of? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a very baritone, almost bass voice, but I can, I can like tenor baritone. I have a pretty big range because I was, um, I, I started learning how to act and sing and perform at the age of like eight. So I was, I was born and raised all the way through this stuff. And uh, I, I, I was just, you know, indoctrinated into theater and, and performance and singing and acting and dancing and stuff like that. Um, I, 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 I tap dance. I used to tap dance for a while. I still have my tap shoes in my closet. Um, but yeah, I, I, would, I found my range. Um, I went to a school for performing arts after high school. I went for, I think it was like a six week performing arts camp at Transylvania University called the Governor's School for the Arts. And there they started to teach me about my specialization. They started to show me what I was really good at. You know, they would, sh instead of like being part of the high school theater troupe where it's like, oh, you would be, you're the best choice for this, these several characters. They would take me to that camp and they would say, you, you are very, very, very good at doing this particular very specific thing. And, you know, for some people, it was arias in opera. For some, for other people, it was, you know, dancing and, and being in the background or being a lead dancer. Um, I went for musical theater, which is singing, dancing, and acting all at once. It's the same. It's, you know, I got to be a little bit good at everything. What's called a triple threat. And uh, I was really, really good at singing. Um, I, I still am pretty good at singing. And they kind of shoved that at me and, 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 and made it very apparent to me that like, you're a good actor and you're a great singer. You have a fantastic voice and you have a fantastic stage presence. You're not a very good dancer, <laughs> but you are fantastic at acting and fantastic at singing. So here is, you know, here are several songs from uh, musicals that you would be really, really good at singing. So I have those repertoire underneath of my bed. Actually, I have the uh, books that they gave me 
and uh, they have all of the songs and all of the, the, the monologues and everything that they needed. So yeah, uh, <laughs> that's where I learned uh, how to sing um, effectively, uh, professionally. Um, I used to do lounge singing at a nursing home. Uh, they would, they, as a, that's how I volunteered um, at the nursing home. I would go in and sing some Dean Martin, some Sinatra. One day, one day I'll be able to sing Sinatra in an anime. I got to say yeehaw in an anime. And I'll eventually I'll be able to say, sing some Sinatra in an anime at some point. So when you did get to LA, um, what was any kind of like professional entertainment job that you... Uh, that you I actually, um, doing, doing the Tumblr stuff, uh, I realized that there are mechanical things that you have to learn um, from like a, a, a computational and engineering standpoint. And I learned how to engineer myself. And then through that, uh, cause my dad, my dad is also a musician. He's an acoustic Celtic guitarist. He's a finger style guitarist, very technical, uh, very sound oriented and like analog sound oriented. Um, he had a bunch of like analog synthesizers in the room that he would screw around with and a bunch of like pedals and knobs and switches. And th th our, our, I grew up around that stuff. And, uh, my dad was able to teach me a lot too. So what I learned was how to set up audio how to, uh, you know, literally engineer yourself, plug things in, get switches and knobs and, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff done. Um, uh, make sure pads are right. Make sure EQ is right. Figuring all that stuff out. And I learned that from him. And then I transitioned that into, I did a little bit of music in college. And then I transitioned from the music into like sound, sound design. So when I would record myself, I would record my voice, edit my voice, and then put sound effects underneath of it and music underneath of it, and then kind of mix that all together into one piece. I have several of those on my YouTube, ancient, ancient stuff, but I have several of those on my YouTube where I would just, you know, put this, these, these soundscapes together and these pieces together. And when I moved to LA, I'm like, okay, nobody knows, nobody has any, can I swear? Nobody has any fucking clue who you are. <laughs> nobody has any idea who you are. Nobody gives a shit. So you need to figure out how to make money that isn't acting for a while. I didn't book my first gig in LA until two years after I moved here. And even then, that was like bits and like extra parts so that people could come in and make sure I'm not crazy or anything like that. Um, so I used that talent and I offered it to other people. I said, hey, if you get somebody, because there's a lot of voice actors in Los Angeles, especially people who are like, how old are you, Chris? Uh, 24. Yeah, people who are our age um, uh, in the mid, late 20s. A lot of people out there. And... Uh, one of the things that you need as a voice actor is, is a demo reel. That's like your, your, your calling card that you give to people and say, this is what I do well. Um, so there are people out here that need assistance in editing that kind of stuff because they don't have the same knowledge that I do. So if I was like, you know, get somebody to write your reel, uh, perform your reel, get all that, like get everything together and then bring it to me and I'll mix it down and I'll make sure that it sounds good. It's got great sound effects. It looks like and sounds like it was ripped from an anime or ripped from a video game or something so that you can kind of fool people, which is the goal of the, the demo reel, kind of fool people into thinking that you've done a, a hell of a lot of work. And uh, I would charge money for that. Uh, it wasn't a whole lot. I maybe did two or three of those a month and that paid rent. And that was all I needed. And then everything else that I made was for food um, or for a bill of some kind, or maybe I could afford a microphone or some candy or a six pack of beer or something like that, you know, just to, to kind of, you know, have some fun or enjoy, enjoy myself a little bit. Uh, but I was, I was living on the, on the floor for a couple of years. Uh, I slept, you know, Jalen Cassell, uh, he voiced, yeah, Okiyasu. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine. I'm going to his place <laughs> in a couple of hours to watch some Naruto. Uh, but uh, he, he's a really good friend of mine. And I slept on the floor of his place for a while. I broke his futon, actually. <laughs> I broke his futon sleeping on it. And we just laid it out on the floor, like, like a tatami mat or something. Um, but yeah, uh, as I was living with him, uh, we went through, I technically was living with him illegally. I wasn't on the lease or anything like that, but the landlord just kind of looked the other way. As long as the rent got paid, he really didn't care. Um, but yeah, I slept on the floor for a while. Uh, it did the, the, the audio stuff and, and, and raised some money that way. So those were the tiny little jobs that I did on the side to make sure that I could pay rent and, uh, not die. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know that, um, prior to Legoshi that you got, a. Uh... Was, a, was Pokemon Masters one of the first things? Actually, uh, Pokemon Masters, what, Pokemon Masters, uh, I did uh, Kengen Ashura. Um, I did a game called Vindictus. Mm -hmm. And those were the first kind of three. Those happened in like the same month where, where people 
so suddenly started, you know, Ooh, who's this guy? I, I'm sending auditions to this guy and I'm getting good stuff back. No idea who he is. Let's try and test him out on something. Uh, and yeah, those are the three that I did. Pokemon masters was great, especially because that was the first property that I, I was familiar with. I, I knew Vindictus, no idea what Kengan Ashura was. I knew Vindictus and, uh, but I, everybody knows Pokemon, right? Um, fun fact, uh, if you record Pokemon ever and you say Pokemon, they will chew you up. They will chew you up and spit you out uh, because it is Pokemon. You say Pokemon across the board. It's Pokemon. Pokemon. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. Pokemon Masters was one of the first things that I did in LA that was, that was professional. And I know, of course, uh, Beastars is how you got in the SAG. Uh, yeah. Uh, Beastars was, was the first show uh, through the new Netflix deal. Um, that was a that was a SAG show. Ken Ganashiro was kind of the that was that was as everything was being finalized, but that was still a non union show. Um, but B Stars was the one that I, I I got I got SAG because I had to be I was the lead in a in a Netflix union uh, anime anime dub. It's a Taft Hartley is a is a is a is the process you go through to do that. And a Taft Hartley is like a two page paid paper that's like this person is the only person on planet Earth that can do this effectively and he is not in sag yet so if I, I have to sign this front page sign this back page to say he's the only person on earth that can do this technically that's not 100 percent true in 100 percent of the cases but it's a good way to get into sag it's a very 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 good way to get into sag um but yeah that's how that's how i that's how i broke in it was relatively simple uh and nowadays it's really really simple to get a, a into sag because um most anime for netflix uh, if not all anime, no, all anime for Netflix are union, and most anime that are uh, large enough or have a large enough uh, community will flip union. However, there are there are there are many examples to the contrary. But uh, yeah, the the union is becoming a, a big part of anime slowly, slowly but surely. And it's probably obvious to ask, but uh, do you still think that you have the most affinity with uh, Legoshi with characters you played? The Legoshi are archetype yeah the, the, the kind of legoshi bubble um i'm really good at playing characters that are grounded um i have a, i don't have a hard time playing like over the top characters i can do that but there are other people who can do it really 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 well so i'm i leave that to them and then they can give me the you know the edge lords give me the the people who have a darker personality give me the people who uh, like to look at the moon, you know, crazy things like that. Uh, so I, I feel like I'm good at, at, at that sort of character, um, person that kind of keeps, plays their cards close to the chest, you know, the, 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 the best friend character I play a lot of, um, I play a lot of dads <laughs> or, or daddy characters may not necessarily dads, but I play a lot of, uh, paternal figures, I'll say, uh, Raiden is one of them. And, uh, so far, what do you think is the case where you've had to get the, um, darkest emotional headspace for probably legoshi i would say um i guess the, the 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 stakes are pretty high in 86 because it's like you know life or death constantly let's see hmm uh aiden caldwell in dying light 2 that had he has a lot of me in him he is he's very much uh he's very much a jonah because he's his face is modeled after mine uh he behaves a lot like me going through the production of the game I gave the game designers a lot of myself and a lot of my own vocal personality to the character. And he kind of grew up with me. So I feel like the most connection that I have to a character is probably Aiden Caldwell. Mm -hmm. But the most character I can connect with would be Legoshi or that archetype, you know, the, the, the darker kind of edgelords. <laughs> How about with uh, um, Adam and Ragnarok? How can you connect to him at all? Um. He again is another one of those paternal figures, literally the father of humanity. Uh, but um, he was a character I, I was not familiar with. Record of Ragnarok, I had heard it, but I've also heard of other uh, other shows that sound very similar. Record of Lodoss War, Record of uh, like there's a, there's a bunch of those shows. So I thought it was kind of in that same vein. Um, but it was he was literally a character that fell in my lap. The director was like, "Hey, we got a show coming up, and we got a, I got a character that needs to sound handsome and human," and I'm like. I got that. I can do handsome and human. Who is it? And then I scrolled through the sides and I'm like, 
holy crap this guy's like a <laughs> this guy's a major fight this is a big character i i thank you for that i thought it was just gonna be bits because usually when they just give you give you a part it's like oh you're man three man eight a businessman three and and crowd spectator four uh but this was a char named character and i looked it up on, on 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 online and i'm like okay so i need to figure out i need to read this first of all so i read it all and it was the next week that they had me that they had me started recording so i'm like Shit, i gotta read this whole thing in like three days um so i read it all in three days figured it all out got i understand when i'm when i'm doing shows like that and when i'm doing when when, when characters fall in my lap i really like even even if if it's just a character that i've auditioned for that i know it's like a major character i like to go and find in in the manga if there is one i like to go in the manga and find okay this is the big line that people like mm -hmm. this is the line that i can't screw up this is the line that i have to make sure is correct or 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 you know um true to the character or something like that so i like to fight for that in the booth for a lot of characters um one one example is uh in b stars legoshi ski desk right that happens a lot in anime and a lot of the time when you would translate ski desk i like you it's like no that doesn't have the same power as i love you right so i really fought to make sure that lego she said i love you and with adam uh it was like uh something like does, does, does a man uh have an excuse to protect his own children or something like that and i had to make sure that that line was there i, I personally had to rewrite some of that um just to make sure that it worked the only crappy part is a lot of the time flaps are an issue so for things like attack on titan there are a lot of people who are very passionate about attack on titan and they want to make sure that everything is the same as the manga but a lot of the time you can't do that from a production standpoint you have to move some things around in order for it to fit flaps and you have to move some things around in order for it to fit a personality or something like that that has already been established for like years uh that we didn't no is going to you know culminate into this right but a lot of the time when you start a show it's not finished yet so a lot of the time you get surprised down the line when you're localizing it but um i try and make sure that that stuff is is, is put forward and is proposed um i don't have the ultimate say in a lot of the th a lot of the things so if the director says nope can't do that or the producer says nope can't do that a lot of time it's a producer who is like from Anaplex or, you know, wh whoever the, the company is in there too. And is like, we have to do it this way, the way I'm telling you, cause I'm paying the bill. Um, and that's understandable. So there is a lot that goes into, uh, anime dubs that people don't really realize. I'm glad that a lot of people don't blame the actors. That's great. <laughs> I would think maybe that like the most fun that you've had of anime so far is house husband or skate. House Husband and Skate. You're right. You're right. Um, House Husband is great because I was able to explore comedy a lot. Um, I've been afforded the opportunity in shows like Sasuke Miano, um, in House Husband, and like season two of House Husband. Um, I got to do a little bit of stuff in Vampire Dies in No Time. Um, so a lot of cool, cool comedy bits. Uh, the comedy for me, and what a lot of people are sl slowly realizing about me, is the comedy for me comes in playing everything as straight as possible. Um, I have a very serious voice. I have a very like grounded down to earth voice. I can get wacky, but, um, with Tatsu, the comedy comes from him playing everything as straight as possible. He believes 100% with every fiber of his being, what he is saying right now, as ridiculous as it sounds. And that's, that's where the funny is. Um, in Sasuke Miyano, the funny is in, uh, the fact that uh, Ogusawada is always super confused about everything. He's confused about this whole sexuality thing. He's not, he's not mean or antagonistic about it. He's just like, okay, so let me get this straight. Like, this is right, right? What I'm thinking is correct, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, and in Skate, I mean, <laughs> Skate is just a fun show to do, period. Mm -hmm. um, I, I cannot wait until that stuff comes around again because Joe is one of my favorite characters. Definitely top five. Something about green-haired boys, I guess, that I do. And green and red. I play a lot of green-haired boys and red-haired boys. Jin, Raiden, Joe, all got green hair. Mm -hmm. And with um, Sasuke and Miyano, uh, do you think that anime or like anime games helped play a part in discovering your own sexuality? Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, Legacy, especially. I, I, uh, the characters who that I play, um, if there is some sort of sexuality there, I always try and play them as 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 bisexual. Uh, that's just me. Uh, Joe, obviously, he's 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 bisexual. It's it's almost canon that he's bisexual. They haven't said it explicitly yet, but I play him bisexual. Legacy, 
I play him bisexual. He he has a heterosexual relationship, but I, I play him. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of mixed signals going on there. So he's trying to figure out his own sexuality. And yeah, that's something that, that, that I discovered. Uh, I, through playing Legoshi, through interacting with the communities of, of, of Skate and, and Beastars and Sasuke Miyano and a bunch of stuff like that, uh, I, I understand that stuff. I understand being confused. I understand being scared. I understand, you know, not understanding who you are. Um, and if I have an opportunity to inject that into a show, not to make it political, but if I have an opportunity to jack that humanity into a show, um, I will, and I will do everything in my power to. Uh, and I know people like David Wald and, uh, you know, J. Michael Tatum and uh, those, those pillars of the community, uh, they do the same thing too. And I'm learning from them. I really am. They are, they are mentors in a way. Um, I, even people like Damon Mills are learning from them. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm honored to have teachers that are, are that intimately involved in the process. It's, it's put them, put themselves out there. It is, it is, it is truly inspiring. Mm -hmm. This is more of a technical, uh, technical question. Has there been a case, yeah. um, anime so far where you've had to alter your voice really significantly for a role? Uh, Tatsu is, is pretty significant. Um, a lot of what he does is yelling. <laughs> he screams a lot. Um, I recently had to do several creature voices, which is something that I don't normally do. Um, I had to do several creature voices that were like, they weren't even speaking English. It was just like, <laughs> like that kind of like nasally back of the throat stuff, lots of phlegm, uh, gross things. Uh, I have yet to play anybody that is too far away from my normal voice. Um, if I think about it for a second, I'm going to try and backtrack yeah, no, it, the, this is a lot of the bits that I play. Nobody really knows, can tell that it's me just because I've, I've altered my voice so much. Um, I'm, you know, extra background characters in a lot of Funimation and Bang Zoom shows. Um, and you just don't know it's me because I've changed my voice to, to some extent. And a lot of people are like, I could hear Jonah anywhere. If Jonah speaks, I know it's him. And it's like, no, no, you don't. You, if, if I'm a main character or a major or a major principal character, you probably can because I will not have to alter my voice too much. But... You don't know me everywhere. You don't see me everywhere. You don't hear me everywhere. Um, we're all vocal chameleons, and we can blend in wherever we really need to. Well, I did listen to um, some of the, the older demos that you had on Voice 1, 2, 3, and it sounds like you have a pretty high register that you mm. slip into sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really get uh, utilized for that, um, which is something I hope to change soon. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the people like it when I use my, like, you know, badass, like normal baritone kind of thing like that. But, um, I can get pretty high in my register. If you go listen to my demo reel, I do all kinds of, um, there's a character that I did, I did way, way back, uh, by way back. I've only been doing this for like two years professionally. Mm -hmm. And by way back, I mean like a year and a half ago, but, um, smite, I did a lot of smite skins and characters and a lot of the skins in smite that I've done have been pretty high register. I did a lot of like, I did this like, you know, New York accent kind of thing for uh, one character and he, he had a pretty high voice. Um, in House Husband, there's a scene where uh, House Husband's wife, um, Tatsu's wife has this like fantasy of being a magical girl, right? Mm -hmm. And she has, a, she has a dream. And uh, the dream is her magical girl, you know, origin story. And this like comet comes down from the sky and the mascot character is there. And the mascot character is voiced by Tsuda-san. And it's, it's, it's Kenjiro Tsuda's like crazy voice. He does like a crazy voice. And I got to do that too. Um, but I could tell 100% that they were directly inspired by one of my favorite magical girl animes, Cardcaptor Sakura. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like... Oh my god, I love watching the dub of Cardcaptor Sakura when I was a kid. And I can totally tell that this mascot character is supposed to be like, kind of Kero, right? So I did this, and, and, and in the dub, Kero has a kind of wild voice that you really wouldn't expect uh, from, but it does sound like a mascot character, and I did, I did an homage to that. I did this kind of, you know, this little New York accent kind of thing where it's like, oh, I, you know, he's up here. And, um... I think it came out really well. It sounds really funny. Um, and if you can, please go watch uh, part two of House Husband. It's, uh, I think it's like the third or fourth episode. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really seen you talk much about uh, Jin and Talentless Nana yet either. 
Yeah, yeah. Jin was another one that 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 uh, fell in my lap. Um, Mami uh, at Bang Zoom, Mami Okada is the casting director there, and uh, she was. I just got sent an email through my agent that was like, "Hey, you're uh, you're Jin in in Talent Was Nana," and I'm like, "He's like he's like the secondary antagonist. That's awesome." I went for a much deeper and i was worried a lot of the fans wouldn't enjoy it uh, honestly i was like i want to do this this is something i want to do but uh this is a voice that i i feel like we should do um the director loved it uh and it turns out the fans did like it they loved it um he's significantly deeper than the japanese uh because uh chris's voice is he's, he's supposed to be like you know early 20s voice wise uh but i made him i made him pretty deep and I wanted to do this maximum edge lord antagonist for this, you know, essentially what is like a, a coming of age, a building's Roman anime. So I wanted to do, I wanted to max out the edge lord. I wanted to like Gara this guy. I wanted him to be like super deep. I don't like one of his lines is I don't need friends. Like that is the most shonen antagonist thing to say across the board ever. And I'm like, okay, we gotta, we gotta like lean into that because this show knows what it is. Like Sean knows what he's doing like sean knows what this show is i know what this show is we need to lean into that as much as we can um i cannot wait to do more chris uh i cannot wait to do more Jin. uh he's he's my sweet little bionic boy and uh he's he's such a badass and i i, I we all know i mean you probably know what happens um coming up in the in the show and i'm, I'm super excited to do some of the you know i guess i'm gonna say sasuke-esque stuff but not quite i'm just i'm, I'm excited kind of a common question too but do you think that um it's kind of maybe more vital for people that want to get into dubbing specifically to have theater experience uh i would say not necessarily theater experience learn how to learn how to perform on a stage that doesn't mean you have to do shows or anything like that i would go take classes and do workshops and things like that maybe do a black box theater kind of thing in person stuff um so because, because acting against somebody is what you have to learn to remove like it, it's kind of hard to explain acting against somebody is an incredible uh incredibly beneficial thing to learn when you're in a booth by yourself acting against nobody mm -hmm. so uh like for here's another 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 uh example all of dying light 2 a triple a action adventure rpg video game i had nobody else to act against at all because that game is a localization it's just like dubbing an anime um so i was in there in a vacuum by myself i was setting the tone for a lot, lot of these scenes um and then maybe the other person had the opportunity to hear me never met rosario dawson in my life i never met any of the other people who are in the game besides the the director and the writer and a lot of the I'm, I'm i'm actually kind of friends with the developers at this point because uh they've, they've just been so cool and i mean they got me this chair like mm -hmm. you're rad <laughs> um but yeah it's uh i would i would recommend learning how to act against somebody um and i know this is hard but like i and and i probably some people would sh would, would would uh kick me for saying this but be wary of taking classes about voice acting online please vet your teachers i used to teach acting i stopped because i realized i was mega unqualified to do that and there is a lot of people out there that are teaching acting that aren't qualified to do it. You need to vet your teachers, find out what they have done and make sure they're not doing it just because they need to pay off their mortgage. Make sure they're doing it because they are a career teacher. Make sure they are doing it because they are somebody who knows how to teach. Steve Bloom is an incredible actor, right? I'm not saying he's not, a, I'm not saying he's a bad teacher. I'm just saying he's an incredible actor. But just because you are an amazing actor doesn't mean you know how to teach somebody how to do that. Mm -hmm. There is a specific set of skills that you learn from other teachers who teach people how to perform and teach people how to act on a stage, right? And those are skills that you alter and move around. And the mechanical skills are things you learn. Mechanical skills are what you learn to do dubbing, to do video games, stuff like that. But the core of your acting experience is something that you can take and move to a lot of different apparatuses. You can do hosting, right? You can do uh, prompter reading. You can do news broadcast. You can do stage shows. You can do voice acting. You can do commercials. If you keep that core 
acting experience there. And please, please, please vet your teachers. Please, please, please vet your teachers. Tony Oliver, in my opinion, amazing, amazing actor, amazing, amazing teacher. He's one person who really knows how to act and teach at the same time. Um, but there are people who are, you know, who have been doing commercials for, for decades that are going to come in and teach you how to do acting, right? But make sure they have the, that set of skills. Go to other people who have taken the class. See what they say. Um, but yeah, make sure you're taking care of yourself and not, not wasting your money because some of those classes are very expensive. And this was uh, another character that, I guess in terms of physical appearance, you wouldn't expect that you would play a uh, Roy in the Hortensia saga. Oh man. Roy is another one of those dicks that shows up to prove that the situation is serious. Um, my, my experience with Roy is, uh, Hortensia saga is one of those games. Um, and I'm not, not, not throwing anything under the bus, but it's one of those games that it's like, Oh, this is, this is totally made to sell a, a mobile game. Like this is, this is, this is a, this is a loosely connected plot to make sure that, Oh, I love this. It's anime. I like these characters. I love these voice actors. I'm going to go play the mobile game too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it, it, it does its job. But uh, Roy's character, uh, I, think, I think the director, when I came in for the first day, was like, okay, your character is basically somebody that shows up, kicks the main character's ass, and then tuxedo masks away just to like, <laughs> it's like, I didn't, you didn't do anything. You just, you just pissed me off. Yep, that was the job. That's what I did. That's my job. And uh, I think... I think he's 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 uh he's a fun character. Uh I didn't work too long on on Hortensia Saga. I think we wrapped it in like two or three sessions. Um but it's another one of those characters that I use this voice, you know, the same uh you you piece of crap, you're bad, you're a terrible protagonist. See ya. Like <laughs> <laughs> um just to piss somebody off, but uh I'm I play a lot of villains and uh I'm fine with that. <laughs> of course it was it was really cool that um your girlfriend got to play like the young version of Courier in Akudama Drive too. He's doing work. Yeah. She can't talk about a lot of the stuff she's doing right now, but oh my gosh. It's like every other day she sends me a text message that's like, they're letting me do this. They're letting me do this. And I'm like, you're getting more work than I am. Like, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's... Uh, it, it was really cool um, that she got to play that 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 character. That kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, in all honesty, it's like two lines and three efforts. But um, she knows me better than anybody else on the planet. Uh, there's no better. Uh, honestly, Br Brittany Lauda made an incredible casting choice. She 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 knows my performances inside and out. And there's no better person to play young Courier than than, than Courtney. Mm -hmm. So, is there any? Uh special story of how you uh, got involved with 86 to start 86 uh there i was i was this was this was a character i actually auditioned for okay. um i auditioned for uh, several characters in 86 i forget who exactly it was i mean it was i was for shin raiden uh and theo i want to say and then like some of the older like ma masculine uh characters that were there that are like you know military types um but I knew I was, I knew I was probably like more geared towards, uh, uh, our green haired boy because it was just, I looked at him and I'm like, you know, I feel like, I feel like I can just hear my voice coming out of this guy. Now there were other people that probably could have played him, you know, just as well as like Ray Chase or somebody else could have played him just as well. Um, and it would have been fine. But, uh, I feel like I brought a little bit of what makes writing special is his humanity um, he has a lot of, like, there's a lot of times when he just sit, you, you, you're, you're very aware, but he's, there's a lot of time where he just sits shin down and is like, look, dude, as a friend, we need to assess what's going on in your head. And if you need help, like he's another one of those best friend paternal characters. He rarely does it with everybody else. A lot of what Ryden does with everybody else is like, all right, settle down, sit down and eat. Come on. Don't no. Put your no. Don't touch. Put your hands to yourself, please. Like he's he's that kind of character. But with Shin, he's he's a little more he's a little more maternal. He has a bit more of a, a motherly instinct towards. I mean, Anju is obviously the the mom of the group, but um, he's got a little bit more maternal with Shin, where it's like, "How's your brain, bro? You doing okay?" And, and uh, that's kind of the role I play with a lot of my friends. Um, I, I I like to sit them down and be like, "Are you?" You doing okay? Is there anything I can do to help you? Uh, can how can we make this easier for you? Uh, but 
yeah, that's something that I really connect with him. Uh, he's not afraid to yell. He's not afraid to get angry. Um, he's, uh, he's got a bit of a short fuse, but, um, he cares a lot about his friends and that's something that I can really connect with. Uh, but yeah, I was, that was not a surprise that I got cast, but it was so much fun because the writing in 86 is poetic in some parts. And I had a lot of input, um, not necessarily on the writing because I didn't need to. That's one of the few shows where I was just sat down and I'm like, oh, wow, this, this works well. Um, there, were some, there were some lines that the director had to rewrite. Um, Ezra and took, actually took a lot of time sometimes to, to sit down and make sure it was, make sure it was perfect. Um, and he's an amazing director. Oh, my God. One of the best directors I've ever had. Uh, and he let me have a lot of performance freedom. I like to think of myself as a very filmic anime actor. And I know that sounds silly. When you think of anime, you think like this crazy, like, you know, uh, over the top, like a little like a, a dial up to 11 kind of voice. But I like to sit down and then just kind of flatten everything out. And I don't let, I feel like anime belittles its audience some, sometimes sometimes i feel like anime belittles its audience especially uh in in some dubs in in the way that it's like if, if i'm not yelling this information at you you won't understand it now in shows like jojo's you kind of have to like you know that's that's just the way it is and that's 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 what everybody enjoys and that's what i like about jojo's like fromaggio and jojo's 12 if not a 13 i was screaming every line and i had so much fun and it worked it worked really well but if I was to do something like that in 86, it would feel very off. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I was to do that with Lego Sheet, it would feel very off. The one thing that I really enjoy uh, about Tony Oliver's direction, um, he didn't direct 86, but one thing I really enjoy about Tony Oliver's direction is that he takes into account distance. Mm -hmm. How far away are these characters from each other? Right? If they're standing like right here, this conversation we're having is fine. Us talking like this is fine. Emily Fajardo, in Sasuke Miano and in Remain, let us do that a lot. And that's what gave, that's what made it so real. I notice a lot of comments on, on Reddit. I read, I, I read the Reddit comments. I may not comment, but I read everything that you have to say about the shows that I'm in, <laughs> I promise. Um, but all the Reddit comments that I read are like, there's, he, it just sounds real. It sounds like he's supposed to be there. It sounds like he's not in an anime, right? It sounds like he's in a CW show or something like that. As over the top as the acting can be sometimes in those CW shows. Um, but yeah, I feel like shows like 86, shows like uh, Beastars and, 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 and Skate and Remain and Sasuke Miyano, they, they, they give you the, uh, the room to be small, the room to be light, the room to be intimate. Um, yeah, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> that was a long rant. Well, do you, is there a moment in 86 so far where you would think you had to get, uh, the most emotionally involved with Raiden? Yeah, there's, he has that, he has that one monologue. I think it's like, a, uh, episode season one, episode eight. I don't know. I, it, it's, it's somewhere like after the first half of the show where he's like, I, I don't want to die. I've realized that I'm going to try and fight as hard as I can. And you need to have that same opinion as I do, or we're all screwed, right? If we don't fight, nobody will. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has that really long monologue. And that was just, that's when I realized doing the show, like I had read, I read the light novel and, and I'm not caught up or anything like that. I, I, I think I'm like four or five chapters off, but um, the, uh, the I, that's what I realized in the show doing, doing the performance. I'm like, okay. This show's going to be something special. This show's going to be something different. This is this is going to be very real. This is going to be very raw. This isn't this isn't Attack on Titan. This isn't a, just your average mech show. This is a war drama about children, kind of like Attack on Titan, but in a completely different direction. Like there are like nukes and shit involved. Like it's 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 a big deal. Um, but that was where the humanity kind of felt really real um, to me and. That's when Ezra himself was like, yeah, I think you're going to, I think you're this character. This is, this is it. Um, you, we're doing a good job here. And uh, there are some times when me and Billy are bouncing off each other really well. Uh, they go, they go, the, the troop shows up to that, um, that abandoned town and they, they act like they're at school for a period of time and uh, they're having fun. 
And then uh, Shin gets distracted for a while. And Raiden kind of is like, hey, dude, what's what's going on? Can we talk? And it's so crazy when when you see that all work as a whole. It's so crazy because you're only doing it in a vacuum. I didn't have Billy to bounce off of in any of those scenes. Um, sometimes I did. But uh, most of the time, I just had Casey. Most of the time, it was I don't know what I don't know what the scheduling was, but most of the time, it was just Casey. I was hearing Billy and I have really good chemistry on screen. Um, it's just like me, me and Damon have really good chemistry on screen. Some people you just really can bounce off of. But yeah, those those were those were a few of the more intimate moments that I really enjoyed. Uh, there's a couple in season two where I have to scream bloody murder yeah. because it's, it's it gets insane. Uh, the stakes get raised you know, miles higher in the sky. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but like, hot damn, we, me, Casey, you know, uh, everybody that just have to go, just have to go up to a 12. And I feel like they cast it that way. They made sure that we could do that. They made sure that the cast could figure that out and, 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 and relate to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can say that the, um, and a lot of people in the sub said this too, that the, the high octane moments with riding, those are just stuff. Uh, really what you did with that that's really uh, like goosebump invoking i appreciate that thank you that's that's the goal yeah <laughs> uh some people were just asking if you have like a favorite legion design or military outfit with the characters oh oh man i, I don't know across the board the character designs are amazing mm -hmm. because when you go into uh character design though the i don't know again i'm not an artist i'm not a visual artist but when you go into character design, uh, one thing I do know is that you need to have a silhouette. You need to be able to just have the, uh, a blacked out character outline, and you need to be able to tell who that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like uh, bar the uniforms, barring those, the character designs themselves are so unique. Because if you put, uh, if you put several characters next to each other from other shows, a lot of the time you aren't able to tell who they are. Oh, this is long-haired girl A. Right. If you don't can't if you can't see the color of their hair, <laughs> you don't really know what character that is. Um, but 86 is one of those shows where not only can you tell from a silhouette of the character who they even if they're just like nude, if there's a silhouette there, you can say, Oh, I know who that character is. But if they have the different uniform on, you can be like, I know what point in the show this is. I know uh where they are, I know what they're doing, I know how they're feeling, you know, that's insane. Um, that's one thing I really appreciate. I like a lot of their casual stuff, honestly. The the jumpsuits, the uh, the flight suits that they wear all the time when they're you know working on the mechs. Um, that stuff is really really fun. Uh, but the uh, more formal wear, you can tell. And again, the the the, the outfits change the scene. Even mm -hmm. if you're wearing the more formal, even as Ezra when he was directing, he's like, you can tell you're in full military. You know, get up here. So try and maintain a little bit more of a. a uh, formal presence and, and formal way of speech, you know, when you're talking to a superior or something like that. But when you're in the, the oiled up jumpsuits working on the mechs and shining everything up, uh, you can be a little bit more casual. You can have a little bit more fun. You can, you, if you're not seeing the mouth, especially, you get to have a lot of fun. That's one thing I want to impress upon people in, 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 in not just the Reddit community, but abroad. If you don't have a mouth as a character, it's going to sound so much better. Mm -hmm. uh i have i have Jin is a character that at some points doesn't have his mouth showing and i can just act my ass off you know uh when there's a uh, mouth not there's, there's another character i i voice that doesn't sniper mask sniper mask and high-rise invasion no mouth shown i can act my ass off they don't have to worry about anything like that but uh yeah so um, we're able to be, even based on uniform we change our, our performances and, and and the way we see our characters and how we interact with each other mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of people asked uh, regarding the, what the storyline is. There members of the Spearhead that you wish were still alive. Oh man, yes, yes, there are. I feel like I mean the the, the Spearhead isn't the same without everybody. Mm -hmm. It really isn't because a lot of the first few episodes is are are are, are them. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like Attack on Titan in the same vein, but uh, at the same time, it's not because I I personally. I started my voice acting career doing Attack on Titan stuff and you know, learning that, oh, this, this, if this character dies, they're dead, right? And they're not coming back. Uh, there is no divine intervention. There is no matrix that you can pull them out of. There, there is no you know, crazy spiritual holding cell or anything like that. They're dead. Yes, I would love to have some of them back, but 
from an actor's standpoint, the characters that we play would not be the characters they are today if those people were still alive. They have changed. They're somebody else entirely. Season one, Ryden and season two, Ryden are two, two different people. And they try and maintain themselves. But uh, would I like to have them back from like a nostalgic standpoint? Yes. Mm -hmm. But as an actor, the characters wouldn't be the same. Even if, even if the characters came back, they still wouldn't be the same people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, there would, be, there would be a lot of uh, tumult among the spearhead uh, if they did even come back. But yes, all of them and none of them. This is more of a funny one. Uh, some, people, sure. some people said, uh, what, how do you think Ryan would interact with uh, Joe or Tatsu? <laughs> <laughs> so is your hair natural or is that uh, something that you did, you know, post? Is that a, are you a bottle green head? Um, uh, I feel like Tatsu would try and clean up the place. And I feel like Raiden would help being, being the mom, but he would be, he would follow Tatsu around the compound being like, you're doing this way too fast, dude. Hold on. Wait, no, no, no. We need to, there's a, there's a method here. We have to make sure we follow the rules. <laughs> um, but yeah. And Joe wouldn't, I feel like Joe would, you know, do a sick kick flip or some shit like that. Like who would, who wouldn't want to go skateboarding around an abandoned airfield or something like that. That sounds like a Tony Hawk pro skater level. <laughs> there were just several people that said that they, um, watched it in English specifically because of your performance. That's really flattering. Oh my God. <laughs> That's so sweet. Yeah. The, uh, the Japanese seiyus I have a lot of respect for, and I understand why people watch, watch the sub. Obviously, Suda-san is one of my, my uh, inspirations. I love, I, I, I've covered a lot of Kenjiro Suda's roles. Um, but uh, yeah, if watching the dub is, is a reason, if, if, if I am a reason you're watching the dub, I guess I'm doing my job right. <laughs> This is a sidetracking, but is your sure. is your wish list role still uh, Vincent Valentine? Yes, yes, it is Vincent Valentine. Uh, I would like to play at some point. I do a lot of. Um, I want to get into more mocap. I've done several mocap roles before, uh, but they've been for like you know, oh, this is for a commercial where we're just trying to get a natural performance, or this is for uh, a video game where you're you know you say one line and then you're done. Um, so there's no sense in like announcing that stuff. Uh, I, I, I feel you just go read through the credits and I'm on my, it's on my IMDB or whatever, but I would love to do more mocap roles, but from a strictly vocal perspective, Vincent Valentine is, is a bucket list. I would love to play Vincent Valentine. Um, I feel like I could nail it. And, uh, he's one of my favorite characters in fiction. I can't say much, but I recently, uh, I, I am going to get to play one of my favorite characters. Can't say much, but I am going to, that, that we, one of them is, is good. I, one of them we, we've got solid. Tatsu actually was one because uh, I got the audition for Tatsu um, and I was lucky because the audition was really only sent to like 10 people in LA. Oh. Uh, and my agent managed to snag that and I got it in, the, in my inbox and I, over here I have a shelf that's like all manga uh, and I have every copy. I had every copy of House Husband. Like I loved House Husband before I got to audition for Tatsu. And uh, they showed, they said they were doing an anime on Twitter. And it's like, oh my God, Keiji's going to be Tatsu. I know it. I know Keiji's going to be Tatsu. He said he would sound great. And then I got the audition. And I'm like, you know what? Let's try my best. And I did it and I booked it. And I didn't expect myself to book it at all. But uh, my agent was very proud of me. And uh, that was one kind of, I guess, kind of bucket list thing that was uh, not as long running as Vincent Valentine. That's for damn sure. Because I wanted to be Vincent Valentine since I was like, 13 <laughs> but we'll see how the chips fall man we'll see mm -hmm. uh, another big one this might have yeah. been covered this might have been covered already but um is there a one single or multiple aspects of writing that you relate the most with i when i go in to do any character i like to take a uh i'm a, I'm a big D, &D player I'm, I'm a dm i play a lot of D, D. as a matter of fact i'm going to play D, D this sunday uh with jalen again who's another dm and uh i like to go in and assign them an alignment uh, whenever i'm working on something because an alignment can inform a lot of a performance it doesn't it doesn't inform everything obviously there's it's a combination of factors but um i like to play lawful good characters and i feel like uh Raiden is neutral good uh because sometimes he he breaks the rules but the majority of the time 
he's he's pretty by the book. There are times when when Shin breaks the rules and he lets Shin know when he breaks the rules. Let me tell you, he gets all up in his face. He gets loud. He gets mad because not only is he going to get in trouble, but everybody else is going to get in trouble. So there are points when he's lawful good. There are points where he's neutral good. But uh, I, I, I connect to him from that standpoint because I'm a huge fan of paladins across the board. I, I love, you know, uh, holy warriors and things like that. Um, I like, you know, using magic and stuff like that. They're, 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 these, they're these paragons of good in the world. And I feel like Raiden is one of those people. Um, I also connect to his paternal side. I have a, I have a younger brother. Um, he's 10 years younger than me. And I, I, I don't talk to him as much as I probably should. But I, I feel this, this paternal kind of like, you doing okay, dude? Like, let me help you out. Uh, I, have that, um, I have that kind of air about myself as well. I don't know what it is. Um, I, people like Joe, he's, he's a father figure to, to, uh, Mia and, uh, a bunch of other characters in the show. Um, let's see who else. Tatsu is literally a father figure to, you know, the kid he babysits. Um, he's a, he's a, he's a husband, which is close to being a dad. There's a lot of characters that I voice with people called daddy, which is another thing entirely, but, uh, <laughs> I have, I have, I voice a lot of paternal characters, um, voice a lot of best friend characters and those, those are the aspects that I, I, I feel like I connect most with, Ryan. Besides the green hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not a question, but the single highest rated comment was um, people were saying that it looks like you could play him like in a live action version based off. That's flattering. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a sexy son of a bitch. Let me tell you. He's, he's a good looking dude. I, I am not probably not as tall as him. I think the wiki says he's like 5'11". Mm -hmm. I am 5'7". I am and uh, I'm, not, I'm not a very tall man. But put me on an Apple box and I'll look great. Uh, but if they ever do a live action, I'm sure I'm sure I, I would I would be a consultant. I don't know if I'd I don't know if I'd actually uh, play him, but I could, I could. <laughs> I appreciate it, Reddit. Thank you. <laughs> Was there or is there uh, any aspiration for you to try and pursue on camera? My rule with on camera is if I'm approached and they want me to audition for something, I will. But I am not personally going to go out of my way to do more on-camera stuff because, in all honesty, uh, doing video game work pays better. And it pays better for time invested. Uh, there are some on-camera projects that I'm working on right now, but they are more in a like hosting, informational kind of like I play myself capacity and less me playing a character. I... I would like to try it, um, maybe do, doing some character work in, in film, uh, but I feel my talents are better served with VO, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have a better voice than I do a face, and I already have a pretty nice face. So, <laughs> um, I think that's most of it. Is there anything that you want to say to the 86 sub? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I want to say I love you guys. I read everything. I may not comment, um, but I read everything you guys say. I was I was I was reading the the thread earlier today about all I was reading all those questions and stuff and one of them was who who would my wife would be yeah uh, in the show Karena I have a thing for redheads I just do and and uh, I don't know she's got red hair red eyes she's she's super cute but Anju has that big mommy energy so it's a tie between the two of those. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that's upcoming that you can safely talk about that you're part of or? Oh, um, the Dying Light 2 DLCs are, are coming in June. Um, we, I think they're actively working on those. So keep on a lookout for those if, you, if, you just, if you're playing Dying Light 2. Please play Dying Light 2. Uh, it, I've worked on that game for six years. I played the main character, Aiden Caldwell. Um, he has a, a kind of a similar swagger to Raiden. So if you enjoyed, if you enjoyed Raiden's performance, you'll definitely like Aiden. Uh, he's got that edgelord persona. Uh, let's see. More episodes of Sasuke Miyano are coming out, so uh, keep on the lookout for those. I got big news today, but I can't talk about it, <laughs> which sucks. But I got big news today, and I'm very excited. I can't wait to reveal that stuff. Um, but yeah, that's about it. I think. Okay. Well, my final question is always asking, "What do you want your legacy to be?" I want people to realize that you don't have to have a piece of paper to do what I do. You don't need a 
uh, like a diploma or anything to do what I do. Um, I also want people to realize that you don't have to, you don't have to be the professional actor. I'm a streamer. I'm a gamer. I'm a rude, crude dude. You know, if you follow me on Twitter, I say some pretty out of pocket shit sometimes. Uh, you know, uh, you can be yourself and be an anime voice actor or or whatever at the same time, as long as you present yourself to other professionals professionally and you do your own side, that's good. Uh, uh, that's like, like example, Roger Craig Smith. He is one of my idols. Roger, Roger Craig Smith, Matthew Mercer, um, and, a, and a couple of other actors are, are, are my, my VO idols. Roger Craig Smith is an astrophotographer. He has a hobby of astrophotography and they look amazing. So uh, just being an actor and just being a voice actor doesn't have to be everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do a lot of other things. Um, at the same time and still have just as much fun. So I want my legacy to be actually, you know, scratch that. We are working slowly. A bunch of us voice actors are working at uh, making sure that people who are coming up in the next generation, you know, people who are even before, even after Gen Z are going, because I'm kind of like skirting the line between Gen Z and millennial and whatever. But um we're trying to make sure that people have an avenue to become voice actors because we didn't know how we didn't know what the fuck to do. We had no idea how how to, how to make this work. And people come up to me and it's like, how do I be a voice actor? And we are trying to build resources for you guys. We are trying to build, you know, it's starting out. They started out with a Facebook group, but I, I told them, I'm like, you know, what, Facebook is kind of like on its way out. Let's try and do something else. D Bradley Baker has an amazing site, which I'm sure a lot of you guys know of. I want to be a voice actor.com. It is the repository of any and all voice acting information that you can possibly find. Anything you want to know, you can learn at I want to be a voice actor.com. But me, Ben Diskin, uh, Griffin Poitou, a bunch of other actors are slowly trying to put together this, uh, I don't want to say college, but like this, this place where you can go and ask actively working actors pretty much anything you want. And we'll try and give you an honest answer as, and we're not, not the convention answer. We'll try and give you an honest, like, here's what you should do. Here's what I did. Um, because our path to this, everyone's path to this is different. Ben Diskin came out of the womb, a SAG actor, right? That's, I didn't, I came here, slept on the floor for two years. And then, you know, I became a SAG actor. Kira Buckland, you know, worked on a bunch of fan stuff as well. And then, you know, slowly became the wonderful actress that she is and, and, and doing the incredible uh, performances that she is. Um, so everybody's path is different. And we're going to try and make that a little bit more uniform. We're going to try and make sure that there's resources there for people to actually do this for a living, regardless of your acting background. Um, granted, the first step may be learning how to act, but... Regardless of your acting background, this is something that we want to make accessible for you guys. So I figure out, I, th I think that's what my legacy is. I want to make sure that this is easy for people to get into. Um, maybe not uh, the easiest to be like the best at, but definitely easy to start. And you know what you have to do. There is a roadmap there. Mm -hmm. I know it's kind of subjective too, but um, is there something that you want people to take away from your performances so far? Anime isn't just Dragon Ball Z anymore. Mm -hmm. I want people to realize that there is a human element now. It's there. It, we want shows to make you cry and laugh. Um, we are getting some of the best actors that I know to sit down and bring life to these characters. Anime is so much more than it was 10 years ago. It is swiftly becoming worth more than terrestrial television. And that is a lot. Um, when Sony owns Funimation and two of the largest anime distributors on the planet, that's saying something. Anime isn't just DBZ. Anime isn't just Miyazaki movies. Uh, there is a lot more humanity and love and attention that goes into this now. My, my, my buddy Jalen, and I, I tell people this a lot, but my buddy Jalen really likes to hammer home every show that we do, every show, no matter what you think of it, Every show we do, we go in trying to make the best show we've ever made. Regardless of how it comes out on the other side, people put their brains, heart, and balls into every show. I, I, I specifically do. 
Um, so whenever I'm cast, I try and make it the best performance of my life. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it misses. But um, we don't... Here's the quote that he says. We don't go in trying to make bad anime. Mm -hmm. We go in trying to make really, really good shows. And uh, hopefully 86 is one of those for you guys. Well, thank you. I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, me too, Chris. It was great meeting you, dude. You sound yeah, like yeah. a wonderful guy. Thank you. Um, I hope if, if, if I'm ever in a, in, a, in a town that you're at where there's a convention, come up, I'll get you, I'll get you a free autograph or something like that. Oh, great. thank you. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. All right, man. You have a good afternoon, okay? Yeah, you too. Bye. See you, dude.